Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. We've got an amazing show for you today. First up, Molly and I are going to talk about Kanye's new STEM player, which is a Bluetooth speaker. It's brilliant. It's got a bunch of his content and his new album on it. And uh, I think he's going to make more money on this than he would ever make working with Spotify and the other streaming platforms. A moment of complete genius from Kanye West. I can't believe it's taken us this long to talk about yay, if I'm being honest. This, <laughs> yay of course, all day. <laughs> yay all day. This conversation leads us to a discussion about platform reliance and how being too reliant on one platform could destroy your business overnight. Don't I know it? Google Panda update, <laughs> YouTube algorithm update, Facebook Ouch. rug pulls. We got a lot of advice for you on this topic, uh, and it comes from battle scars that I've gotten in my companies and ones I've invested in. And then uh, Pipe.com has acquired a company in the media space to help people who are selling to the big streamers like Netflix get their money in advance so they can start working on their next project. Really brilliant idea. Congrats to Pipe.com on that acquisition. And finally, because it is this weekend, startups. startups. I sat down with LA24, our accelerator uh, cohort number 24, founder Jose Ordonez, the CEO of AirPals, and talk about her amazing startup, which is trying to do business to business messenger service, mm. but the modern way. Absolutely. And if you want more information on our accelerator, it's launchaccelerator.co and apply to the next one. We'll put 100K in. And then, hey, you never know, you may wind up on the podcast like AirPals. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a great episode. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Notion. Notion is one place for notes, docs, projects, and everyday work that goes way beyond a wiki. Go to notion.so and use promo code TWIST to get $250 off an annual team plan. Lemon.io. Need to speed up your product development without draining your budget? Hire vetted engineers from Europe at lemon.io. Go to lemon.io slash twist to get 15% off for the first four weeks. And Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. So uh, I don't know if you all attended to uh, attempted to attend the live stream of Donda 2 yesterday at stemplayer.com, but it went okay and probably weirdly sold a bunch of these little $200 speakers called the Stem Player. So mm. I'm obsessed with this story because Kanye, of course, has a new album out, Donda 2. And the only way for you to listen to that album other than the mediocre live stream from yesterday is on this $200 speaker, the Stem Player. He's trying mm. to, and this is very interesting because of our ongoing conversations about streaming. Kanye is trying to diversify his revenue stream away from Spotify and other streaming services. He's also, he says, trying to bring attention to how little musicians make on platforms mm. like Spotify. Because, of course, when they first start out, lots of musicians are happy to have anybody listen, right, at yep. all. Uh, so making any money is better than nothing, which is how Spotify generally is able to pay so little. Mm. So... So basically, Kanye is like, no, I'm not doing this. We'll talk about the economics of how Spotify pays artists in a minute. But I want to ask you, Jason, like, what do you think about this $200 device, which is preloaded with his album? Uh, it's genius. Yeah. I immediately saw this and said, Kanye West is a genius. I believe he's a genius. Uh, obviously, he has moments of mania. <laughs> I don't, I'm not clinically describing anything here i'm talking about just straight up description of his behavior when he gets like manic or mania but you know i i know a lot of artists and they sometimes hit a chord uh perfectly. no friend intended uh, uh they, yeah i mean <laughs> or you know that like you know he if you look at his music sometimes he'll have a bar uh that is so perfect you just wonder if this guy is bob dylan reborn right and uh, his his early albums to me are perfection you know yeah. uh late registration no graduation this stuff is just and people will look back on it and i think it'll be like they'll kind of revere him like bob dylan in in you know the early days mm -hmm. uh and this is such a transcendently brilliant idea um can you ask somebody to buy me three of these uh producers take a note <laughs> buy, buy me three of these and then uh seal them in a plastic box and i am going to sell them for $10,000 each in 20 years. If Pink Floyd had done this uh, with a, 
I don't know, let's say Pink Floyd decided to make a vinyl player or mm -hmm. Dire Straits uh, had decided to make a CD player. Yeah, the uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Dark Side of the Moon or say making movies, Brothers in Arms. Mm -hmm. And you would have, instead of a million people buying your album, let's say you had a, when they, when they sell those albums, let's just do a little back of the envelope math here. I think the average artist trickles down like two bucks when they sell an album. Somebody fact check me right now. Um, don't get about the CD era. They sell a million of these CDs. Let's say they make two or three bucks. It's two or $3 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you sell something like this. You make $150 in profit. 150. Mm -hmm. How many do you have to sell? Right. And right. you know, now we're talking about 10,000. Compared uh, which to, is one percent yeah and that's compared to by the way what we think is maybe our producers triangulated some numbers from a various uh number of sources across the web and determined that the per stream rate at spotify is probably something like less than half a cent so that yes. maybe a million streams might equal at best five thousand dollars and to be clear the speaker has more than i mean this is the only way to get kanye's new album it's also but it's a speaker you can use forever it's a Bluetooth speaker you can use forever. And right. it's super cool. Like it's got Groovy. the ability. It's got all these buttons on it that lets you actually isolate tracks. So there was a demo, yeah. I think on the website. Now it's been all replaced with the video of the live stream from last night, the Donda 2 listening party. Yeah. But somebody was isolating like Michael Jackson, just vocal tracks with it. That's why it's called stem because the stem is the little pieces of audio that are you oh, know, embedded in so every then song. You can use that for remixing or just play it or just geek out to it. So genius. Yeah. So it's Costs so genius. no money to do that. I already ordered one. It Full costs disclosure. no money to do that. So yep. here we go. Now imagine uh, somebody released um, the lead guitar of Mark Knopfler a couple of years ago. Uh, somebody can pull up the YouTube video for us and we'll play just a, a quick little snippet of it here for the noties. I, I don't know if we can leave it in the original pod. No, I think we leave five seconds in the original pod. They have the solo from Sultans of Swing. Somebody isolated it. Some engineer must have had it. The ISO track. Mm -hmm. And you hear Mark Knopfler playing lead guitar on Sultans of Swing your mind gets blown. And for like two months, people were losing their minds over that somebody had released this. And, um, you know, here it is, I'll talk over it so that we don't get a violation here. But it's mm -hmm. fair use because when you hear this, uh, you just fast forward it to the halfway mark, you probably get like to a good point. And let's just see if we can all hear this. This kind of wh whose connection is this, by the way, <laughs> whoever works for me and has DSL, <laughs> I I'll pay the extra 10 bucks to get you to <laughs> I mean, what the f <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people right now are like, do you pay the producers? Oh, we're so sorry, everyone. Are they, we're just so sorry. At are they at Starbucks right now? <laughs> so anyway, way to kill the vibe. But it is super, I mean, this is yeah. interesting on a whole bunch of levels, right? One, yes, he, Kanye, as a money-making endeavor, doesn't have to convert many sales to make good money compared to what he would get on Spotify. But that's also not entirely the point. Like, mm. There's the there's the business decision itself, and then mm -hmm. there's this question of what it means for these streaming platforms, who artists have been coming for for a while. This could be a tipping point. Like this I really could be a This is one of those things that breaks people's it's brains open. Deal. So right yeah. now, Taylor Swift's team is in a room today, mm -hmm. looking at this, saying, "Okay, remember she's re-recording everything. She's got a five hundred dollar version of this with." five live performances and a bunch of other stuff. So when I sold my angel book, I said, guys, I want to do a companion podcast called angel. And I want to include the first season or the first five episodes in the audio book at the end as a bonus. And audible was like, awesome. Audible was stoked about this. Yeah. And I think it's why the why that worked. So I'm, I'm looking at this. And I always said to myself, we have so many episodes of this podcast, at some point, I'm going to take them all down. And then just the first thousand episodes will be available on a thumb drive for, I don't know, what would you, noties, what would you pay for the first thousand episodes on a thumb drive that I autographed and you just had all thousand with video and audio? What would you pay for a hard drive autographed by me with the first thousand episodes if I took the other thousand down? Would you pay a thousand dollars? Would you pay five hundred dollars, three hundred dollars? Just put it in the chat. I think people would pay 200 bucks or whatever. And I just think it would be a cool thing to do. Yeah, it's sort of it's like the Disney approach. Right? Yeah. And, and we have this expectation, like consumers have this expectation that everything is going to be available to us to stream forever, anywhere we want it. Mm. There might be some ads, we'll skip them. Yeah. And like, the truth is that 
the economics of that don't always work out for creators. They just mm-hmm. don't. And so you're seeing people start to push back on that concept when they can afford to. Yeah. And also figure out scarcity in a digital age, which, you know, interestingly is sort of what NFTs are about. And I do think that there is without question something to this. And huge. It's a big, it's a big, big shift. Yeah. I mean, and the next move would have been for him to sell only a hundred thousand of these or only ten thousand and each one is numbered. Right. And one out of a hundred are autographed by him. And you randomly get those. And you could window it. Like he could window it yes. and say, and I don't know what the plan no one ever no one of course knows what the plan is. This is available for streaming in other locations, but he could say it's gonna only be or or whatever Taylor does, it's only gonna be available. 30 days, 90 days. For yeah. 30 days exclusively on this Genius. speaker, and then it's going to go out to the rest of the world. Genius. 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 And then yeah. what happens is, what if he does this, and he makes so much more money than being on Spotify that he says, you know what? Uh, screw Spotify. I'm going to put like two songs on Spotify, get the other eight. So he could just yep. drip out one song at a time, take it down, put two songs up. And now all of a sudden, if the top 10 artists were to do this, they could negotiate different deals with Spotify. They can say to Spotify, like, I'll do this. I'll give you my album after 30 days if you uh, take orders for these. And I'll give you 10 bucks for every one you sell. And I'll take the 140 of the rest of the profit. So they could, you know, Kanye could then negotiate with Daniel Ack and say, take it or leave it. You mm-hmm. want my content. You got to sell this for me. Yeah. And I, I, I have the Sirius XM app. And I guess these players have a hard time making money. Uh, with just subscriptions and they have been popping up every time i every other time i open the app they pop up like hey buy tickets to this concert so it knows your geo right, right. it knows where and so they're just upselling and i guess they must make ten dollars per ticket when they sell them so yeah i mean this is brilliant kanye's well, a genius seen, yeah i mean the music and you know we have this idea that the music industry is like done like it's baked and this is what it looks like now no, like artists have been mad about streaming for a long time. And this is a, the start of a revolution, I think. 100%. Startups need a central hub to store information and collaborate on work more than ever because we're all working remote across different time zones. People are making their own schedules. It's a different world, folks. We all know that. When we went fully remote in March of 2020, Notion became our internal knowledge bank. And we added another 10 people to our organization. And every time they came, we had the same experience. They would ask us a question, they would get a Notion link. Then they would say, oh, I have another question. Oh, we didn't write that down. We would add it to the Notion page. They say, oh, do you have a checklist? I love checklists, right? Well, go to thisweekinstartups.com slash checklist and check out the 100 point founder checklist. That's all all hosted on Notion that you can copy and then run through the checklist yourself on Notion. Every team from engineering to sales can work together seamlessly. And they have 500 integrated apps, including Google and Slack. Hundreds of thousands of teams worldwide are already delighting their employees with Notion. And really the employees drive this. Once you give them Notion, they're happier, they're calmer, they're more focused. It just makes you ridiculously productive and the product is always improving. So go to Notion.so and use the promo code twist to get $250 off their annual team plan. I use this product literally not every day. I use it, I would say every hour of every day. You can experience just how amazing Notion.so is. I mean, I know this sounds like a personal endorsement. It kind of is. I love the product. So go to Notion.so, use the promo code twist during checkout, get the $250 off your annual plan, and then see the magic. Let me know how it works out for you. I'm sure you're going to love it. And you know, Bruce Springsteen sold his catalog for over 550 million, the publishing rights. Yeah, I think they could do things like uh, sell these kind of devices with their entire archive on it. He would sell a million of them for $500 over time. Mm-hmm. It would be the ultimate collector's edition uh, to have every album and then every bootleg. So I'm into bootlegs of like Dire Straits. So when I, when I ski, I just go on YouTube and people post these full concerts. Yep. And I just bookmarked my make a playlist and I listen to concerts. And for Anybody who's an aficionado, that's eventually where you wind up with whatever band you're into, is you wind up listening to the live concerts, and they own the rights to those live ones. Mark Knopfler sells all his live independent concerts on his website, so Mark Knopfler, if you're listening, like he sells thumb drives at the concert when you're leaving mm. of that concert, so there's mm. a service that does that. What I want is I want like the best three concerts from each tour. So just artists out there now, it it just opens up any number of possibilities. Right. 
or labels out there. Hello. Let's be honest. There's still a big media middleman here, but it's so interesting because the, the theme of today has sort of accidentally turned into this question of letting a platform mm. control your business. Yes. And interestingly, Jason responded to a viral thread yesterday about oh, yes. not Good segue. being reliant on any one platform, right? I love a theme. Here we go. The thread was written by Joe Spizer or Spizer, Price Spizer, a serial Spizer, entrepreneur. Yeah. E-I is usually like an I yeah. pronunciation. Spicer, sure. I'll Joe Spicer. We're going to just call it that. Yeah. Serial entrepreneur and angel investor whose prior business was evidently killed after becoming too reliant on Facebook. J- Joe is not alone here. And he's agreed to come on the podcast next week. So consider this a little bit of a preview. Oh, is he coming? Great. Awesome. And he, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that's correct in our notes yeah, here. Yeah, he'll come. Yes, he'll He come. responded to me. Yeah. Great. And it's such an interesting thread because he posted it yesterday and was like, this is the first time I've publicly talked about this mm. in four years. Yeah. And the, you know, the TLDR here, and we'll go through some of his specific points, but the TLDR is that he built a massive startup entirely on the back of that Facebook traffic. Yep. And the Facebook algorithm. Yep. And then Facebook changed the algorithm and the business died. I remember this time period because there was somebody who created a LinkedIn competitor. Somebody can Google it for me. There was a LinkedIn competitor inside of Facebook. And then there was Zynga Poker and Farmville Mm -hmm. inside of Facebook. And what happened was the virality of Facebook and the amount of people were spending time there. If you played Zynga, you know, poker or whatever, if you invited people, they gave you more chips. So that viral loop went crazy. And all of a sudden, Zynga had tens of millions of members. This person got tens of millions of um, people watching his video and following his pages. If you remember, Facebook launched pages. Then what Facebook did is the classic rug pull. Branch out. Branch out was the name. And branch Mm -hmm. out had become worth like $100 million. It had 50 million members. And then Zuckerberg turned it off in one day. Boom. And he didn't turn it off. What he did was he said, if you want traffic, you have to pay for it. And people were like, well, wait, no, people subscribe to my page. And I paid a dollar per subscriber for my page because you told us we could promote our page. And I did an experiment like this. You can look up Mahalo Guitar Lessons and Mahalo FitBod. And we had done, and actually somebody could pull these pages up and and show us on the video. Uh, And we did a little experiment. And I met personally with the Facebook team. Like I'm talking top members of the Facebook team. And they were like, hey, what can we do? I was like, well, we're putting our videos on here. We have a deal with YouTube. YouTube's giving us 55%. Give us 55% of the revenue. Match YouTube's deal. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, we're not going to do that. And I was like, well, you're asking us to pay to get followers to our page. And now we're not getting our organic followers to our page. What's going on? And they're like, yeah, well, we're just like, you know, tweaking the algorithm. So people get a blend of things. And we had like 100,000 followers on some of these pages. And I very quickly realized, wait a second, we're only getting 1000 people are seeing the videos now. But in the beginning, 100, all of the people were seeing it. Yep. And I was like, okay, I, I, I know a rug pull when I see it. So they're pulling the rug. I feel my feet like I'm like wobbling. And I'm like, I look over, I see Zuck on the ground pulling the rug. And I was like, <laughs> He's the guy. I just stepped off the rug. <laughs> yep. I was like, I'm out of here. I told him straight up. I was like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> you're getting us to pay for followers. And then you're going to make us pay to reach those same followers. And that's exactly what they did. So wow. all this free traffic was no longer free. And what's so interesting is, okay, so, you know, in the, we can dig into some of the specifics in this thread, but the, the company was called Little Things, a female focused feel good entertainment company. And yes, it was built on the back of Facebook and the eyeballs. They had, you know, hacked, figured out how to use the newsfeed for these articles. Facebook was promoting it, right? Mm. Hosted them at yep. headquarters, profiled Little Things. And then what's Same interesting thing they did with me, they hosted me too. <sighs> And then what's so fascinating is that the change here, this is what I think is super important. The change here was not just that the algorithm changed randomly. It changed because, according to Joe, our high-level contacts at Facebook said, Zuck didn't like the fluffy content we were producing and (laughs) wanted to be taken more seriously. He wanted the country to respect Facebook and get their actual news there. Hmm. Previously, it was family wow. and friends updates, feel good viral content. So yeah, this is a business story, but it's also very much mm. a publishing and editorial story. Very they pulled the rug because of an editorial determination. Again, according to Joe, we have no yeah, way we, to confirm We don't know this. Zuck's state of mind or what he was doing. That seems directionally That's correct. That's a huge deal. Uh, you know, yeah. I think it's directionally correct because I don't know if you remember this, but it was getting a little annoying with Farmville and some of the games. Um 
to constantly get mafia invites and Farmville invites in your feed. Mm -hmm. So there was a reason to throttle those because you had so many, if only 10% of users were playing Farmville, but they kept posting every three or four days to get more, you know, mana or, you know, plants or whatever. It was just annoying. Yep. Um, so they, they needed to throttle that. But this is, you know, the lesson here is never be dependent on one platform, which is why when we post our show to YouTube, we're on YouTube, but we also have podcasting feeds and we're experimenting with video on Spotify, but, and we have email and we were syndicating the video to LinkedIn. I never want to, as a, as a content creator, be dependent on one platform. You want to work all the platforms mm -hmm. and then build your brand. So people go directly to your domain name, direct traffic is what uh, all VCs and investors look at as a proxy for, are there any number of users who are going directly to your site? So if you were Mr. Beast, are people typing Mr. Beast into Google search? Mm -hmm. And are they does Mr. Beast because when I talked to Mr. Beast, I was like, how many emails do you have? And he's like, what? And I was like, I told him this uh, over um, dinner. Uh, I said, your job should be look at how many subscribers you have on YouTube, and then judge yourself on the percentage of emails in your database as compared to your subscriber count. So if we have right now 190,000 mm -hmm. subscribers for this week in startups, how many emails do we have? Do we have I think we have like 15,000 emails. So we have maybe 8%. Great, I would like to have more. So we have mm -hmm. to build our email products up. Actually, with the launch ticker, we probably have double that. So that's just how I think about these things is how many phone numbers and emails can you get to build a direct relationship? Yeah, I have 50,000 people on my personal email list. So that's great. And so keep building your list up. And uh, Fred Wilson wrote a blog post about this called be your own uh, in which he was saying like, you know, the startups I'm in forgive the language, the colorfulness of it, like you don't want to be Facebook's right in this example. And he said, be your own. And what he was saying was build your own platform and yeah. have your own email lists. And so that was a very famous. And then people were like, well, what about you're telling people to build this is in 2012. I think he wrote this, because there's a big controversy about these rug pulling instances, YouTube had done some rug pulling, and then they backtracked on it. So YouTube was doing this algorithm game. And the top people including myself, I wrote a famous blog post, I'm not going to work on YouTube's farm anymore, like Maggie's farm, where I was just like, you know what, I don't want to be dependent on these platforms. In the YouTube case, I might have made a mistake because my YouTube channels have done so well. <laughs> uh, we own a YouTube channel called exit. If you go to youtube.com slash exit, it has 3 million subscribers. Now it makes the, the Mahalo YouTube channels make $250,000 a year to this date. And I pivoted Mahalo to inside.com and inside.com makes a quarter million dollars a year just off of, you know, defunct channels. And I've actually started posting videos to exit again with a partner. And it's actually doing pretty well now every time we post a video. Um, so I kind of made a mistake on that one. I, if I had kept going, I would have yeah. probably had a good exit with Mahalo if I just went all in on YouTube like other people did. It is interesting though, right? Because it's like there was a time when you did have to pick a platform and go all in on them. Kind of, yeah. You could have made a lot of money on it. And then, you know, right around 2019 or whatever is mm -hmm. when a bunch of them changed their algorithms, Facebook in particular. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't, I don't blame, you know, at, at the time that Fred Wilson wrote that, it was prescient and also not realistic for everybody trying to build a business. I mean, I guess the question is, like, yeah. do you build a business in the most expedient fashion? Yes. If somebody had come and said, like, we don't we don't want to build our business on the back of Facebook, even though that's an incredible opportunity and everybody's making ton of money, tons of money. Instead, we want to spend like a crap ton of money on CapEx and our own servers. Like, it's a good bet that somebody would have said to them, like, why? Why are you going to do that? When you're scaling your startup quickly, hiring engineers can slow you down like nothing else. We all know that. Well, here's some good news for you. Lemon.io will find you the perfect candidate within, wait for it, 48 hours, I kid you not. And what is Lemon.io, you ask? They're a marketplace of engineers from Europe, where some of the greatest engineers in the world are based, and they'll match you with a candidate, again, within just 48 hours. That's two days for those of you doing the math at home. And if it doesn't work out, they're going to replace the developer right away. So there is no risk for you with the founder of a startup and they test and interview every developer to eliminate the risk of a failed project. So we got a testimonial from launch portfolio founder Drew Fabricant and he told us that Lemon was a game changer. 
for his startup, Scout, which is a lead gen platform. They do great stuff. They were under the gun. They needed to hire a developer with a very specific skill set as soon as possible. And Lemon delivered. And they were a pleasure to work with, according to my pal, Drew. So not only did they find exactly what they were looking for, but Lemon also delivered them a second engineer really fast. What a great story. So here's your call to action. If you could use a full-time or part-time developer to run your projects faster, I want you to go to lemon.io slash twist. Again, lemon.io slash twist. And you're going to receive a 15% discount for the first four weeks of work with a developer. What a great deal. Here's what you want to do. This is the high art is look at all these platforms as marketing yes. that will go away and get burnt out at some point. So that's how I look at TikTok. We're not investing heavily in TikTok. There's some fan channels that have been growing this week in startups and raising awareness. But eventually TikTok will do the same thing to people. And YouTube will do the same thing. Spotify might do the same thing to us at some point. So the platforms are going to do what's best for them. And we're going to do what's best for us. Mm -hmm. And so if at some point, Spotify is awesome for us, we'll spend more like I don't tweet Spotify links, I tweet the iTunes links right now. But if Spotify did something for us, and they're like, Hey, Jake, Al, if you started tweeting the Spotify links, we'll promote you more. I'd be like, Okay, let's let's dance. Let's have that discussion. But I like being independent, test each platform, whichever one gets you the best results, use that platform. But keep yep. You know, keep your keep the other platforms in the mix. Right now, I think live video is best on YouTube. I think YouTube is the, the best place to do it. So that's why we do it here. And we consolidated restream to just do it here. But I think if LinkedIn were to give us more promotion and LinkedIn got us, you know, and that got us 500 or 1000 live viewers. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's a product manager at LinkedIn, if LinkedIn came to us and said, hey, we'll guarantee you 1000 live listeners, I would move the show to LinkedIn mm -hmm. for a couple of months, right? Sure, but exclusively? Not? Maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe. Yeah. I'm not sold on exclusivity. I think that's that's the real question that we're having mm. here, right? If you build yeah. only on one platform or you distribute only on one platform, if your goal is audience, mm. you limit your audience with exclusivity. You just do. And so the money can be worth it, but it might shorten your overall like lifespan. Like your well, 15 you minutes might go to 13. For, you could also negotiate for audience, Molly. So let's say you have True. an average on Twitch. And then YouTube says, hey, we'll feature you. Now, YouTube doesn't really do that too often. But if LinkedIn might, because mm -hmm. we're a business show. Mm -hmm. So if I was LinkedIn, I would be going to all the business shows out there and saying, because they have a live product, and it's pretty good. And we stopped using it because all of, we'd only get like a couple of dozen people over there. And we get hundreds over here on YouTube because people have the YouTube app and the subscription stuff works. But if they said, hey, we'll pin you uh, to the top of people's feeds in New York, LA, and say, the Bay Area. Yeah, from 10 o'clock to 1015. And we'll get you like to a 1000 users. And then we'll take the pin down. I'd be like, Okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's try it for three, six months. And sure, why not? So you would have to negotiate that you would get three times as much traffic to then go exclusive. But right. I, you're right, Joe Rogan it has to be worth it. Yeah, yeah, it has to be worth it. And so it's a negotiation. I'm with Toby Zhang here. LinkedIn mm -hmm. should give twist $100 million for four years. We don't need money. I mean, that's the that's other thing is about. like, uh, I'm looking this show is profitable. Mm. It does well we sell out the ad. So we don't need money. What we need is uh, to help founders mm -hmm. uh, and and may, and have great guests and impact, you know, an impact. Well, we so impact. Yeah, that's what I've been thinking about is the impact of the show. Um, yeah. And that's why I'm really coveting the noties. I feel like figuring out who the top 1000 fans are, which we've been recording who the noties are, and then inviting them to real world events and really working with them to be adjunct producers. Mm -hmm. I think that's the path to us climbing the rankings and building the audience. I, I don't mean, know. community is the, and this is, again, this does Secret go weapon. back to, to exclusivity. Community is the best investment you will ever make. When you build that army that yeah. cares about you and will yep. follow you for years, decades, even, you know, defend you on the internet, like, yeah, it's, and, and be your friends in the real world. You meet them yeah. and you're like, oh, we've been having a conversation for 15 years. Like we I just mean, you pick up it, where yeah. we left off last episode. It's amazing. Exactly. All right, everybody, as you know, we or maybe don't, I launched something called the launch ticker, like over 10 years ago, <laughs> I had an associate of mine. Uh, actually, uh, it was Megan uh, from TechCrunch. Megan Dickey. Mm. Am I getting her name right? God, it was so long ago. It was when I lived in LA. And I told her I hired her out of school. And I said, I want you to write in a uh, Google Doc, the top news stories, because I'm spending too much time reading tech news. And she would write the um, tech news. And I would, I had a monitor turned on its side. And she would write it in a Google Doc for me. And I said, just write in one sentence what happened. And it's going to be called the ticker. And launches the name of the investment firm says so it's called launch ticker. 
And I just paid her to do that. So I didn't have to read the news and I was up to date. And it was so addicting that I shared that Google Doc with a thousand VC friends and other CEOs. And like 300 people were in it live. And then I made it into a product, a number of people subscribe to it, it makes a little bit of money every year, we break even on it. And it's called the launch ticker. And it's basically two emails a day. And then tech meme kind of cribbed the idea where they were rewriting the headlines. So what I told her was rewrite the headlines, take out the spin, and just write it factually. So anyway, uh, what we're doing is we're gonna have the launch ticker become part of this week in startups, because it's been kind of like this little isolated thing I'm doing. So we're going to rebrand it maybe the this week in startups ticker or the startup ticker. I'm looking for some ideas for names. Uh, but essentially, it'll be part of the this week in startups family. And the launch ticker uh, is going to be uh, where you'll see startup news. And today we uh, have the top story from there. And this will be our startup of the day. So we're going to do our startup of the day every day in the launch ticker and here on the pod pipe, uh, which you know, is a startup that helps uh, subscription based companies think com.com or fitbod or a SaaS company, they help them get what's called non dilutive capital. And you get this capital in advance. So if you have a predictable revenue stream, Molly, like let's say you were, I don't know, slack in year one, and mm-hmm. you had $50,000 a month in SaaS revenue, you could go to a pipe and there's competitors to pipe. Uh, I forgot the names of them, but we don't need to say them here. Uh, what they would do is they'd say, Hey, here's 150,000 your next three months, or here's a year, actually, the way pipe does it is it does a year. So they'll sell to other investors on their marketplace at pipe your yearly revenue for 92 cents on the dollar. Then you pay it back, that investor gets a dollar, you get 92 cents now. So you Mm -hmm. can deploy that capital now to make Slack better, or to make com.com better. So com maybe could have just sold $120,000 worth of forward looking subscriptions and not needed an angel, right? It's Mm. really, really cool. Yeah, clever. Uh, and so it's a very cool company. It's been doing well. It became worth a couple of billion dollars. Uh, and a number of bestie friends of mine, I think Sachs is an investor. Anyway, pipe.com just announced that they're acquiring uh, purely capital purely capital specializes and this is interesting in entertainment and media financing. So for all those little projects that are trying to get a mm. documentary podcast off the ground, for Got example, it. I would imagine that this is a hmm potentially an option. They say the problem is that producers, creatives, and right holder, rights holders wait years to see the full revenue from their work. Payment terms from streaming giants tend to be quarterly over three ah. to five years for licensing content. So now they can close that gap by trading the three and a half, three to five years of revenue and getting paid up front. Got it. If you had sold your documentary, I guess, to Netflix, you would be getting payments for the next five years. They'll give you right. those payments up front to make your next documentary. Is how I'm reading this, I guess so, or even the one you're currently making, maybe cool. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But I kind of want to know more. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, these Mm -hmm. things, uh, if you're a creator, getting money up front is helpful if you have to buy equipment, yeah, or you have to pay talent or something. And so, you know, the streamers, or your SaaS customers are paying you monthly, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. And this is just a way to get it advanced. And uh, I think the way this works is they take your contract for your residuals for your future payments, they sell it to somebody else on their site. So pipe isn't buying it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the magic of it is that it's a a marketplace. Mm. So then people bid for what they think the max value of that is. So for pipe, I've had some of my subscription companies sell their revenue in advance. And uh, they were were quite happy with it because I think they got 89 to 92 cents on the dollar, which is pretty great when you think about it. I'm not sure that who these investors are. But I guess they're happy to make 10% on their money. Uh, so it's interesting. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could probably talk about this for a long time as long time media and content people that feels a little riskier because sometimes I mean, sometimes those projects fall apart. And then you might yeah. be on the hook for that money. To be clear, you have to have this isn't like seed funding, you have right. to have you have a to have guaranteed a signed deal revenue, and revenue mm-hmm. stream and they're advancing against that the chances of default are very low. If right. you do default, you still have to pay it. Which is so why it's a relatively low return, like 10%. Exactly. Relatively. So if you were Slack, and let's say you lost half your customers, and you still had this loan, you still got to pay it back. Yep. And so when Harry Hurst was on this podcast, we talked about this with the bad debt. I think the way they work against it is they only take companies they think are top flight. And so yeah. I think with this new acquisition of purely capital, they're only working with you know, like the top streamers, Netflix, Disney, etc. So you're, you're not going to find inventory on here as an investor that's low grade. Right. 
Only everybody is deeply invested, no pun intended, in not having any deals fall apart. Nobody wants that. Correct. And Harry said they will, when there's a default kind of situation, they're, they're obviously in the best, in, the, the, the pipe.com has, it's in their best interest to fix things. They don't want to have people be bag holders or feel terrible. So they, yeah, they go to work fixing it. Yeah. Uh, so they, they work that out. So congratulations to Purely Capital. And if you want to sign up for the launch ticker now and see us work on this transition to it being the This Week in Startups ticker, uh, which will be basically the same content. We're just going to kind of rebrand it and get the This Week in Startups audience into it. It's twice a day. Paid is twice a day. Free is just the mornings, I think. And so just go check out thisweekinstartups.com slash ticker and the branding will start changing and uh our guy john walton who writes it every day uh is kind of going to be the fourth producer here at this week in startups you know getting up early and giving us some story ideas so give us some feedback on the ticker uh, if you sign up for the free one and let us know what you think of it you can either go to launch ticker.com or this week in startups.com slash ticker we don't want to make it molly a promotional tool for this week in startups we want to make it like an email that really gets you up to speed on startups and capital allocation the concept here is to take the things we're doing on the show and embed them there so i think we live in the future as a segment in the newsletter could be a great idea like right? we'd have we live in the future in both properties and they don't have to be in sync so he could do a we live in the future segment every day and then we could take the best of those and put them on the pod right so that would be a great first step, I think, in this integration is to have startup of the day and we live in the future as a segment every day in the ticker. Love it. Okay. Well, speaking uh, in a roundabout way of the startup of the day, <laughs> you know that I have been interviewing members ah. of our Accelerator cohort, yes. Accelerator 24. Mm. Today, uh, next up, right now, Jose Ordonez, the CEO of AirPals, which is basically trying to do with them to the messenger service industry what Uber did to mobility. It's super fascinating. It's sort of one of those cool, unknown business opportunities that right now is done with like clipboards, cash and super slow, you know, quotes. Yeah. Um, and it's just she's she's all hustle. I love I love this founder. I it's a great company. saw this business. And I was like, yes, invest in this because if she figures it out, it's gonna be a huge business. And it was a business that Travis at Uber wanted to go after which was moving mm -hmm. big items, a TV, uh, a computer, whatever, a sofa from point A to point B. But they just Uber never got to it. And it's a really arduous, painful thing to do. And it requires somebody to be just ultimately focused on just that. So if you're in a major city, how many times have you said I want to move, you know, have this desk, I have a stand up desk, somebody bought it, or I have an office in Brooklyn, and I got an office in the Bronx, I want to move these things from point A to point B. How do you do it? Right. There's never been a really good service. There's a bunch of like, I think they call it man with a van on Craigslist, a little sexist language, but you know, you give, or two dudes with a van kind of situation. And then that doesn't feel very safe. So they're well, those building. are those are one offs. But to be clear, what AirPals is going after is yeah. that thing where you are a business and you just need to move stuff around all the time. Maybe you're a production yes. company and you need yes. all that furniture, for example, to show up at a shoot or yes. you've got a messenger documents that literally can't be sent digitally and there's all yeah. these sort of business to business messenger services that are like sketchy or slow and yeah. and they're solving that problem which is like business still involves a lot of stuff going yes. places yeah and so they've just made it effortless and you know press a button get a quote so good. and go all right everybody uh, enjoy the interview Listen, when you're the founder, it's fun to trade war stories with other founders. Recently, Balloon CEO Amanda Greenberg, one of my awesome portfolio founders, told me how Vanta's SOC 2 solution helped her save an important deal in the final hours. If you don't know, Balloon sells a SaaS productivity and collaboration software package. It's brilliant. And when they needed 10 documents in place within 48 hours in order to close this deal, well, Vanta saved the day by supplying customizable templates and helping them through the process to close. So if you don't have your SOC 2 tight, you can't close major customers. And you know what? A lot of startups wait. Well, the waiting has to end. You have to work with Vanta's compliance software to make it easier to get and renew your SOC 2. They continuously test against technical and non-technical SOC 2 requirements, and they partner with over two dozen audit firms who have been trained to file SOC 2 reports directly within Vanta. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant within just two to four weeks compared to three to five months without Vanta. And guess what? 
Vant is such a great partner. They're going to give you $1,000 off your sock too. Thanks for that, Vanta. Here's your call to action. Get $1,000 off at vanta.com slash twist. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash twist. That's vanta.com slash twist for $1,000 off. Well done, Vanta. So the Launch Accelerator recently started its 24th cohort. And each week I'm sitting down with some of the founders to dig into their businesses a little bit. Last week, in case you missed it, I interviewed Growth University founder Craig Zingerlein on episode 1387. That's at the 38 minute mark. Next up on the program is Jose Ordonez, founder and CEO of Air Pals. Welcome, Jose. Thank you so much, Molly. You actually pronounced my last name correctly. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> you did it. Yeah. Jose, tell us about Air Pals. What do you do? So we essentially help teams with their local logistics. We're a B2B marketplace for courier services and we handle complex um, business requirements. So like the upgrade or the evolution of the delivery platforms, right? And that's what we're doing. And that's just the beginning. We're going to tap into supply chain and other more fun stuff in the future. So what's wrong with messaging and courier services now for professional shipping, basically? At the moment, uh, the market is using legacy couriers that operate over the phone, through emails, a, a lot of back and forth. And some of them are more innovative, but they're using all the shelf software, which limits their, their ability to innovate, provide a better experience and scale. So that's what we're doing differently. Can you give me an example of a use case? Like who needs this and when and what do they need to happen? Absolutely. So we have a bunch of customers within the fashion industry, fashion media, photo, a production and they use our platform to move items that they need for their internal projects. Like, for example, samples and materials, fabrics from the factory to the studio, photo equipment, other supplies that they need for their daily operations. So that's um, something that we're, you know, focusing a lot in that vertical, but this expands across multiple uh, industries. For example, we have customers in the healthcare system um, and uh, corporations, tech businesses and small uh, organizations. And so you would think, given the amount of money in this industry, that it wouldn't be something that just happens with, you know, phone calls and fax machines. Like, are you essentially taking this extreme necessity and bringing it into the modern world, it sounds like? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a former producer and fashion designer. So I used to spend like around 2K on a three-week project. And that doesn't make sense. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for the project, uh, you know, affecting the bottom line of, of the companies. So that's why I wanted to create these, you know, essentially first to uh, make the life easier for employees similar to what I was doing, production coordinators, project managers, assistants, and, uh, you know, provide uh, an affordable service to other companies that in the past couldn't afford these tools and these services. There is, in fact, a famous tweet that our producer Nick has been looking up as we talk that essentially says, find a business basically that's profitable. Here it is. How to get rich without getting lucky. Find a company that has a lot of profit, one, and two, a fax machine, and go compete with them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And um, I I also found another tweet. Um, I don't have it handy, but um, I remember uh, one BC tweeted, I can't believe it's 2022 and we still need to request quick quotes. So that's how, you know, most of our competitors operate. Uh, As a customer, you request a quick quote and it takes two days to get. Right. So we, we provide the first thing we provide and our customers are loving is upfront pricing, essentially bringing that experience that people have using in their personal life. Like, for example, Amazon Prime or Uber, providing these same experience in a business setting. How do you do that? I've seen a demo and you're saying you're, you're calculating this in real time with an algorithm. What are the factors that go into calculating that real-time pricing? Well, we take in consideration multiple things. Uh, first, um, distance between point to point time, the parcel uh, classification, uh, that's the three main things. We also have other proprietary elements that we we put into that formula, but those are the essential ones. And then a couple other differentiators for you before we get into your pricing structure, you also employ your drivers, right? Well, we have a hybrid model. Okay. We operate with full-time drivers and highly better contractors, which is something that we're testing is really working well. Uh, this was um, conceived based on what we have learned of the over the past 12 years uh, of on-demand marketplaces and also what we've been looking into the legacy couriers that, you know, those are businesses printing money throughout decades 
and they're still here. So they might be doing something right. So we're kind of like mining the best of both worlds. And um, that is allowing us to decrease operational cost, increase margins per route, and provide a, a better experience to the customer. Some other differentiators, this is not on demand. This is not like calling a Postmate to bring you a thing when you need it, right? You have these pickup windows so that you have some some semblance of a schedule. Yeah, similar to a Amazon a Fresh, right? You, you set up pickup time windows or drop a delivery time windows, actually. Um, so we have um, the same approach. We integrate that into our technology. So if you request an airfall, of course, it's not going to arrive within three minutes because you work at a company from nine to five. You have the entire day to get that done, which works well. And on our end, you know, that is allowing us to increase the package density per route and essentially have more flexibility for the engines to run and make things more efficiently. Of course, uh, you know, and this relates to pricing, maybe we're going to discuss further, but we're going to um, offer, you know, added benefits to the customers that have more urgency, like uh, uh, upgrades to make the order rush, right? Mm -hmm. Because we understand that uh, a time window might not be working for everybody. And then talk to me about how... Uh, the pricing works. You, it's a subscription model, right? So a company would sign up for this, and just you'd be their one-stop shop for all their messaging. Um, not actually, but uh, at the moment we are transaction based. We charge, um, we take a commission for every order, a uh, thirty percent, which is higher than industry standards. Uh, we are launching subscription plans, but not like other companies have tried in the past and fail because it's impossible to add a subscription based on something that has variable cost. Gotcha. Our subscription will unlock added benefits like free upgrades, free cancellations, a, a discounted member uh, pricing for the customers in the plan, a, other uh, features like, for example, multi-user accounts, things like that. And um, so that's how the subscription is going to work. We actually are piloting, piloting this with a, a real estate company here in New York. It's working well and we're excited to finish building the features to start selling those. And uh, another revenue stream that we're working on is enterprise contracts. We did a four-month contract last year with a high-profile customer, which the LTV was around 60K, right, within those four months. So we see a huge opportunity to integrate deeply into the operations of our customers. I want to go back to what you said a minute ago. You take a 30%. It's a 30% take rate? Yes. It is. And and people are happy to pay that because it comes reliably and on time. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how much higher is that than the industry standard? Standard. Well, actually, something that we're super grateful with the legacy couriers is that because they have higher cost, the price is super high, right? Mm. So they set up a high ceiling for us to play around, and uh, so we're actually um, providing very competitive pricing. But, um, you know, still what we do is not something like we're, you know, transporting a $30 pizza. So these are different things, uh, different uh, requests. Uh, so we have a lot of flexibility in the pricing. Right. And so overall, in the aggregate, customers might be paying less because they're getting a more reliable and reasonably priced service. Yes, exactly. We're using technology to bring a, that cost a little bit down. And because we want to... Um, do this and make AirPods like a habit forming com a platform. A and we understand that budgets are a huge concern for our customers. How do you see the, the, the TAM? Like who, how many companies are there out there who are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis who you think could benefit from this? So the TAM is actually growing. A, the total uh, addressable market that uh, the local couriers yield is around 113 billion. So mm -hmm. it's a huge, huge market. And this is just talking about the US. You know, we, this is, um, this is a hyper local logistics is a huge issue for, for the entire world, actually. Um, and as, as I said, you know, this goes across verticals. So fashion, healthcare, uh, tech, um, law firms, you know, uh, in the past people used to, to hire messengers for documents, but now we're, you know, moving evidence for law firms, things that, you cannot use Dropbox with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not everything is digital. And we understand that we're bridging that uh, concept about um, a, a digital and physical workflow, right? And this is a huge trend that we're seeing, for example, remote workers, somebody working in LA for a New York-based company, but they don't need to come here to to do physical things. They can hire an airport, right? They can place an order through a platform. This is also... Escalating, we see people overseas uh, with operations in New York placing orders from outside the country. 
So this is unlocking uh, the future of work too. So we can tap into other times as well. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's so interesting that there are a lot of people out there who don't realize that in the course of doing business, a lot of companies need to move literal stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Back and people forth. people believe that everything can be solved by software. Yes, it does. We're solving things with software, but there are things physically uh, that cannot be done by software, right? So that's what uh, we're doing. And then tell me about your team because the team is somewhat remarkable. 100% Latinx American and 50% women? Yes, that's correct. So that's very important for me. I am a huge believer of uh, diversity. My background is in, in, in sustainable design. So I used to collaborate with people from different uh, backgrounds, cultural and professional. And I see how that impacts on uh, the product. So uh, we are 100% Latinx American, people from Brazil. Um, most of the, uh, the team is in Ecuador, which is uh, my uh, hometown, a uh, home country. And um, in terms of females, you know, I do believe that having females in a tech product uh, bring different changes. For example, logistics products are, um, you know, cold and boring. And these are a, this is a platform that employees are using it and we want to make their job enjoyable. So we, you know, having females in the team bring a fresh perspective for what a logistics um, tech company should be doing. Tell me about some of your customers. There are some big names on this list. Yes, uh, since we launched, we were able to work with amazing companies ranging from huge nonprofits like the David Lynch Foundation, Far, which is a Brooklyn based uh, fashion company that is trending right now. Uh, we have done things for Lime, Google, Peloton, uh, Bumble, public hotels, and the list goes on and on. So that's also part of our strategy. We are building a uh, relationships with companies that have a footprint uh, all over the country. So uh, in the, in the near future, in the, in the next year or so, we will be able to open new markets with these existing uh, relationships. And how did you acquire those customers? What's your go to market strategy? So they are um, feeling the pain. They're looking for a solution. So at the moment we're leveraging. Um, SEO and um, uh, Google Ads. Uh, of course, this, this year we're going to explore other channels, but that's working really well. As well, we have a strong word of mouth um, traction and, you know, the network effect also kicks in. You know, when you're an employee sending something from your company to an external studio, then p other people get aware of their platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, so then give us the basics. You incorporated in February 2021, how have you been doing since then? Yeah, so uh, so in our first year of operations, we generated 150k, uh, and um, that was amazing. Uh, especially when there is a time where a lot of companies are pre-product, pre-revenue. So we are super proud that we were able to to achieve that milestone. Um, we our purchase frequency is increasing, as as I said, AirPods is a habit forming a plat a platform. So once you get it done one time, you see how easy it is, how much time we are able to get you back on your day and customers start using it more and more. And then finally, the question that I'm asking all of our accelerator founders, because everyone wants to know, what is your path to $100 million? Great question. So first is um, geographical expansion. Uh, this is a hyper logistics for businesses is a huge problem across the US. I, especially for the most business dense cities. And on top of that, we're going to leverage enterprise um, contracts uh, that as well will uh, increase the, the predictable revenue that we can bring to the company. And um, that's, that will be the, the first two steps to, to hit that number. Jose Ordonez, founder and CEO of AirPals. Thanks so much for the time today. Thank you. Hey everyone, producer Nick here. I want to tell you about the SaaS Syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product and market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to thesyndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, to apply to raise from the SaaS Syndicate. And you can join Jason's Syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at thesyndicate.com. Producer Justin here. No cool startup? Check out OpenScouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 
10% of our carry. Hey everybody, producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at remotedemoday.com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university slash charity. 